resting on a wall above the altar in a temple to the Phoenician gods, is a tablet detailing a journey ventured beyond the known world to the coast of West Africa by Hanno the Explorer. This video is a part of Project Africa, a collaboration with over 20 channels exploring the rich and varied history of the African continent and its peoples. In this video, we'll explore the Periplus of Hanno around the West African coast, trying to reconstruct his voyage by analysing the source and also exploring the peoples of Africa that Hanno meets along the way. I'm joined by Voices of the Past, who has lent his talent in reading out the source for our analysis. Be sure to check the description for Voices of the Past video on his channel, where he reads the source in full, uninterrupted as was intended to be delivered in ancient times. Before we begin Hanno's journey, we should first examine the context of his journey and the source itself. The Periplus is one of the only fully intact Carthaginian sources dating to sometime around the late 6th or 5th century BCE. However, it is important to note that the version we have today is a translation from Phoenician into Greek by a scholar generations later during the Hellenistic era. And because of this, there are naturally errors in the translation that Hellenize certain details of the text as we find in the opening statement of the Periplus. This is the account of Hanno, king of Carthage, about his voyage to the Libyan lands beyond the pillars of Heracles, which he also set up in the shrine of Kronos. Hanno, king of Carthage was rather most likely a Suffet, a high magistrate leader of a Phoenician city. The confusion probably came from Hanno's clan, the Maganids, who ruled in his time as the leading family of Carthage. Carthage at this time enjoyed the hegemony over the Phoenician world following the decline of their mother cities in the Levant. Many of the Phoenician cities surrounding the Mediterranean gradually fell under their influence along with the expansive trade network that facilitated them. Exploration and trading were key features of the Phoenician expansion, always looking to exploit untapped markets such as the mineral rich lands of Tartessos or the purple dyes of their homeland. Hanno then was sent on a similar mission of expansion beyond the pillars of Heracles, the Strait of Gibraltar, to explore for new markets in the lands of Libya known to us as Africa. The Carthaginians ordered Hanno to sail out of the Pillars of Heracles and found a number of Libophoenician cities. He set sail with 65 oared ships, about 30,000 men and women, food and other equipment. These 50 oared ships, otherwise known as Pentaconters, were the precursors to the triremes that were the staple of classical naval warfare. They saw a lot of use as boarding ships as their large crew of rowers proved decisive over smaller ships in ship-to-ship -ship combat. However, in what they gained with the larger crew, they sacrificed in storage space for rations, meaning a Pentaconta rarely ever saw a voyage longer than a day's trip. It is more than likely then that Hanno used some other type of smaller galley along with trade freighters to carry their women, food and equipment for the journey. The number 30,000 is also unusually large. Now, it was possible for a population of that size to migrate on a large enough fleet, although Hanno was probably settling trade outposts rather than full cities along the African coast. So an estimate of 5,000 people is more reasonable. After sailing beyond the pillars for two days, we founded our first city, called Thymiaterion. Below it was a large plain. The biggest trouble in analysing Hanno's journey is that our main metric of distance is sailing and days. In our modern world of satellite maps, we can accurately chart the distance from point A to point B relatively easy. Ancient people, of course, did not have that available to them, and attempts at cartography left maps that looked extremely distorted when compared to the same thing. 
Rather, they perceive their landscape in measurements of time, varying between topography and speed. It made more sense for them to understand how long a trek would be so they could be prepared for the journey or leave on time for the right weather. As such, Hanno's journey is all tracked in days. It could be assumed then that on the flat open seas with no hills, marshes or rivers to slow him down, that his journey would be more or less direct at a constant speed. Now that would be possible in the modern day of powered engines, but in Hanno's era of still primitive ships, sea travel was heavily based on currents and sailing winds that would greatly speed up or slow down their journey based on the direction and time of year. Accurately calculating the distance sailed each day isn't possible, although we could guess a minimum average speed of about 60 nautical miles or 100 kilometers a day. Thus, with the favorable trade winds of the Levant and the northeasterly winds, Thymiaterion could be placed near the plain of northern El Jadida. Thymiaterion, in Greek, is an altar of incense. Although this could be a poor transliteration of the Punic word Dumatheria, meaning a plain, which better fits Hanno's description. Sailing westward from there, we arrived at Soloius, a Libyan promontory covered with trees. Here we dedicated a temple to Poseidon. Sailing to the east for half a day, we reached a lake. It was not far from the sea and was covered with many long reeds from which elephants and other wild animals were eating. Following down the Maghrebi coast, Hanno arrived at Cape Canton, known to him as Salois, or Selayim, rocks. This was probably already a Phoenician outpost at the time. The temple to Poseidon he established is a Hellenization of the Punic god of the sea, Yam, literally meaning sea. Hanno was looking for divine blessings to guide him safe passage through the Tensift River to the east, which he mentions in the next line. After our visit to the lake, we sailed on for one day. By the sea, we founded cities called Karakon Techos, Gite, Acre, Melita, and Arambis. The Carthaginians were already present along the Maghrebi coast down to Mauritania which is evident from the presence of Punic tombs and artifacts. Hanno then was likely reinforcing these outposts as part of his mission. The names of the five fortifications appear to be transliterations of the original Punic names. Karakon Tekos as Ker Chares, Gete as Geth, Akra as Hakra, Melite as Melet, and Arabis as Ha Ambin. Continuing our voyage from there, we reached the Lyxos, a large river flowing from Libya. The Lyxites, a nomadic tribe, were pasturing their cattle beside it. We remained with them for some time and became friends. Beyond them, hostile Ethiopians occupied a land full of wild animals. It was surrounded by the great mountains from which the Lyxos flows down. According to the Lyxites, strange people dwell among these mountains. Cavemen who run faster than horses. The Lyxos River and the Lyxites appear to be a misnaming by the translator. We do know of a major Phoenician city called Lyxos, but it was located south of Tangiers, meaning Hanno would have backtracked significantly on his journey. Rather, it is accepted that Lyxos is the Dra'a river, and the Lyxites are a Berber people. Hanno's friendliness with the Lyxites shows the nature of his mission as a trader exploring new markets, although it is possible that they were already familiar with the Carthaginians. It should also be noted that the Periplus continues to mention Ethiopians, but do not mistake them for the people of the same name in East Africa. Rather, the term Ethiopians comes from the Greek word Ethiopas, literally meaning having a burnt face, and was a catch-all term for all black peoples. When we had got interpreters from the Lyxites, we sailed along the desert shore for two days to the south. After sailing eastward for one day, we found in the recess of a bay a small island which had a circumference of five stades. 
We left settlers there and called it Kern. We calculated from this journey that this island lay opposite Carthage. For the time sailing from Carthage to the Pillars, and from there to Kern, was the same. Kerna or Kherna, as it would have been pronounced in Punic, was the furthest Carthaginian outpost on the Maghreri coastline, and its name literally means the last habitation. It still maintains a similar name of Herna Island, near modern Dakla. Hanno estimated that Kerna and Carthage were about equal sailing distance away from Gibraltar, and his calculations appear to be correct. Beyond Kerna were uncharted waters for the Phoenicians. From this point onwards, Hanno was exploring new lands. Due to this, much of the contentions with the Periplus begins from this point onwards. Sailing from there, we crossed a river called Juretes and reached a bay which contained three islands bigger than Kern. After a day's sail from here, we arrived at the end of the bay, which was overhung by some very great mountains, crowded with savages clad in animal skin. By throwing stones, they prevented us from disembarking and drove us away. Leaving from there, we arrived at another large, broad river, teeming with crocodiles and hippopotamuses. Returning from there, we went back to Kern. The river Kerites appears to be a corruption of the river Kremites, which is mentioned by Aristotle as flowing from the same origins as the Nile River and is identified with the Senegal River. It is important to note that according to how the ancient Greeks perceived the world, it was thought that the Nile River did not continue southwards, but rather curved to the west from the Silver Mountains. The Senegal River flows from the Bambuk Mountains, one of the largest sources of gold in West Africa. The next line mentioning crocodiles is another important note as to the Greeks, crocodiles only lived in the Nile. In fact, their name in Greek means the lizard of the Nile, thus further connecting the Senegal as the Atlantic mouth of the Nile. Hanno seemed to have discovered this gold market and attempted to negotiate a trade with the local Mandika people of the Bambuk Mountains. Obviously, this deal did not work out, and Hanna was chased away back to Kerner. Although, it is interesting to note that Herodotus relates a similar anecdote about Carthaginians trading with natives beyond the Pillars of Heracles for gold. Perhaps, after more successful trade relations were established following Hanna's voyage. Another story too is told by the Carthaginians. There is a place, they say, where men dwell beyond the Pillars of Heracles. To this they come and unload their cargo. Then, having laid it orderly by the waterline, they go aboard their ships and light a smoking fire. The people of the country see the smoke and, coming to the sea, they lay down gold to pay for the cargo and withdraw away from the wares. Then the Carthaginians disembark and examine the gold. If it seems to them a fair price for their cargo, they take it and go their ways. But if not, they go aboard again and wait, and the people come back and add more gold till the shipmen are satisfied. Herein, neither party, it is said, defrauds the other. The Carthaginians do not lay hands on the gold till it matches the value of their cargo, nor do the people touch the cargo till the shipmen have taken the gold. From there we sailed to the south for twelve days. We remained close to the coast, which was entirely inhabited by Ethiopians, who fled from us when we approached. Even to our lick sites, their language was unintelligible. On the last day, we anchored by some big mountains. They were covered with trees, whose wood was aromatic and colourful. Although it is written here as twelve days, the original text declared the journey as two days. Now, it is commonly believed that the two-day voyage is a scribal error in the translation, as it would be impossible for Hanno to voyage past the Senegal from Kerner in that amount of time. Instead, it is fixed as either six days or twelve, depending on the interpretation, placing Hanno's anchorage at either Cape Verde in Senegal or Cape Palmas in Liberia, although I choose to believe it to be Cape Verde. The fact that his Berber translators seem unable to translate the local languages 
showed that Hano was at least somewhere in the lands of the Niger Congo language family group. Also note his attention to a fine trade good with the aromatic and colourful wood. Sailing around the mountains for two days, we came to an immense expanse of sea beyond which, on the landward side, was a plain. During the night, we observed big and small fires everywhere, flaming up at intervals. Rounding Cape Verde brought Hanno to the wide estuary of the Geba Delta. The myriad of fires surrounding him, no doubt coming from the Bisagos Islands. The Bijago people, who populated the islands, had strong trading and maritime traditions. Perhaps Hanno sought to establish a trading relationship with them for the palm tree oil that they harvested on the islands, an exotic luxury good. Taking on water there, we continued for five days along the coast until we reached a great bay, which according to our translators was the Horn of the West. There was a large island in it, and in it a lagoon, which was salt like the sea, and on it another island. Here we disembarked. In daytime, we could see nothing but the forest, but during the night, we noticed many fires alight and heard the sounds of flutes, the beatings of cymbals and tom-toms, and the shouts of a multitude. We grew afraid, and our diviners advised us to leave this island. Sailing around the Horn of the West, Cape Palmas, the Guinea current would have pushed Hanno far along the coast towards Lagos Lagoon. It could be guessed that Hanno had heard of the bronze and gold trade of the Nok people, located in the interior of Nigeria. But this is just speculation. Regardless, it appears he landed in the populated area of the local Yorumba people, who scared off the invader. Quickly and in fear, we sailed away from that place. Sailing on for four days, we saw the coast by night, full of flames. In the middle was a big flame, taller than the others and apparently rising to the stars. By day, this turned out to be a very high mountain, which was called Chariot of the Gods. What Hanno describes is the violent eruption of a volcano. The mountain, the Chariot of the Gods, appears to be Mount Cameroon, an active volcano known to the natives as Monga Maloba, the seat of the gods. It stands as one of the tallest volcanoes in Africa, towering above the rainforest that surrounds it. Hanno's description is the first we have of Mount Cameroon's eruption and is naturally apocalyptic. Sailing thence along the torrents of fire, we arrived after three days at a bay called Horn of the South. In this gulf was an island, resembling the first with a lagoon, within which was another island full of savages. Most of them were women with hairy bodies, whom our interpreters called gorillas. Although we chased them, we could not catch any males. They all escaped, being good climbers who defended themselves with stones. However, we caught three women who refused to follow those who carried them off, biting and clawing them. So we killed and flayed them and brought their skins back to Carthage, for we did not sail any further, because our provisions were running short. Entering the Horn of the South, probably the Gabon Estuary, Hanno details the capture of gorillas. This is the first ever use of the term and it's the origin of the name we use today. However, they probably weren't gorillas. Their agility and timidness doesn't align with any description of gorilla behavior. Instead, they must have been some other breed of ape. And so, with the collection of gorilla hides and the shortage of provisions, Hanno ends the story of his voyage. In analyzing Hanno's route, it becomes clear that the account is vague and confusing. The version given here is but one understanding of the voyage. Some place Hanno's journey no further than Sierra Leone, and others claim he managed to circumnavigate the entirety of Africa. The obscurity of the text has caused some debate over the nature and intention of the account. It is theorized that the Periplus is intentionally vague as to not betray Carthaginian trade interests. The Strait of Gibraltar was tightly controlled by the Carthaginians to protect the various trade imports coming in from the Atlantic. This was possible 
through misdirection and secrecy. Hanno's account is filled with fantastic escapades, but is also wrought with dangers such as the troglodytes, hostile Ethiopians, and a mountain of fire. It is designed to fascinate the reader and boast Carthaginian ability, but at the same time leave vital knowledge out and amplify the dangers to those who would dare venture. This brings us to the end of the second video for Project Africa. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to subscribe and head over to Voices of the Past video to hear Hanno's voyage as it would have been read in ancient times. The rest of the Project Africa playlist can be found in the comments below.